Chi, in the same subject about the what happens when when there's a human Neanderthal hybrid, and she will explain to you. She explained to me in detail how she's doing that, and I will not venture to try even to communicate that to you. So, uh, Karen, at the moment, um, in 2017, she was UCT's national, she was the national winner of the Science and Technology Three Minute Thesis Award competition. Um, she is about to undertake, she's a postdoctoral fellow at the Human Evolution Research Institute at UCT, where she intends continuing her current research and delving into research on teaching human evolution in schools. So let's all give her a welcome. You shouldn't have any problem hearing me. I'm usually quite loud. Uh, had an American advisor. So I'm going to be talking to you today about um, some of the topics that came up in my thesis. Not all of this research has been done directly by me. Um, I think going into some of the nitty gritty would actually be a little bit boring and tedious. But luckily the background information is so interesting that I hope you uh, enjoy. In 1980, Jeanne M. R. released her best-selling novel, Clan of the Cave Bear. In this novel, she described a young girl who was separated by her human parents 30,000 years ago and raised by a clan of Neanderthals. In the novel, the girl grows up a little bit and becomes pregnant by one of the Neanderthal teenagers and gives birth to a human-Neanderthal hybrid. The story in general, despite all being not a paleoanthropologist, not somebody who teaches or studies human evolution, actually touched quite nicely on some of the very fundamental scientific themes that were heavily debated at the time. Were Neanderthals like us? Did they look like us when you put the flesh and their hair on? Could they speak like us? Did they have communication? Could they think like us? Could we breed with them? And if we bred with them, what would they look like? What would those hybrids look like? So let's go a little bit backtracking. What is a hybrid? Luckily for many of us, we have Google. And of course, Google is very helpful, as you can see. <laughs> Luckily, many of these animals do not actually exist in nature. I think the, the shark, running shark would be quite terrifying, uh, or at least outside of the world of Harry Potter. But I think they do show something quite nice about trying to get across the definition of a hybrid. A hybrid is the offspring of animals or groups of animals that have had separate evolutionary trajectories. Of course, in this picture, those animals of, who will be the parents of these hybrids are very far apart and therefore very unlikely to have any offspring. Um, in the case of the elephant and the butterfly, there's even different reproduction methods and different lifestyles, so it's very unlikely that that would occur. But in general, hybrids do exist in the modern world, in the world that we exist as well. One very famous example is the mule. Mules, for those who don't know, are the offspring of horses and donkeys. And what's very interesting about the mule is that it has a combination of both of the traits of these parents. One such trait is that it is big. Another trait is that it's very strong. And this makes it a very good work animal. And it inquires both of these traits from both the donkey, which is very strong and the horse which is much bigger. Furthermore, and I think this is actually very important to raise up, the mule has also inherited behavioral traits from both parents. It's not stubborn like the donkey, but it's not skittish like the horse, which means that you can train it very, very well and make it do things for you, which is not always easy in the former animals. This makes it a very good animal for transport and for agriculture. Another famous 
hybrid animal is the liger. Of course, this beauty has some of the traits of both a lion and a tiger. Tiger is usually the female of the tiger is the female of the liger, female parent of the liger, the mom, and the lion is the father of the liger. What's incredibly interesting about the liger is that it's actually larger than both of its parents. So it's larger than a tiger, making the liger the largest cat in the world today. Ligers usually only exist in captivity, mainly because at the moment, the environments for the tiger and the lion do not overlap. It's very likely that in the past, natural hybrid zones could have occurred and ligers could have existed in these zones. <laughs> of course, naturally, a lot of you probably already have on the forefront of your mind, first of all, these are unusual animals. They're animals, in the case of the mule, that are conducted by human breeding, or in the case of the liger, in captivity, also anthropogenically, by humans. And you'd be right. Those two examples, while very nice examples in explaining how hybrids look, at least in the way we think they look, they're not very useful in terms of thinking about hybrids naturally occurring. Another thing that's undoubtedly on your mind is, if animals can hybridize, can we call them a species? And this is because your mind has been corrupted by the biological species concept. It's only a joke. It's very fine if you use the biological species concept, which states that if animals can hybridize successfully, they cannot be called different species. More naturally is if Animals are different species if they can no longer actually or potentially interbreed with one another. So can we call a horse and a donkey separate species if they have a mule? Maybe yes, because a mule is infertile, not making it a very successful offspring. But what about the case of the Chihuahua and the Great Dane? Of course, a lot of you don't want to think about that because that involves mechanical problems at best. But that is a realistic concern when thinking about the biological species concept. Sometimes animals, which are not very far apart, if you think about them genetically, the, the Great Dane and the Chihuahua are only separated by m at most a thousand years, probably only a couple of hundred, but they can interbreed, really, but not very well. And then you get animals like baboons, where different groups of baboons can interbreed after two million years. So what do we call the species in the case of genetic differentiation or how long or how long ago they were initially separated? Is that a better way? Maybe, maybe not. Some people use morphology. There's another problem with the biological species concept, at least in terms of my discipline. How do you know fossils interbred? It's not any easy way of testing that, is there? So while the biological species concept is indeed useful in some instances, it's not always so. And so when I talk about species, subspecies, and taxa, some of you might get angry and you might have every reason to do so, especially if you want to bring up very specific definitions. But know that in general, in both biology as well as paleoanthropology, these definitions are fairly fluid. But when we do talk about hybrids, we're talking about groups that have separated for a little while at least, and have come together and formed something a little unusual. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Hybrids actually do occur in nature. One that I think we're gonna be seeing a lot more of is the pizzly bear, which is a hybrid between the polar bear and the grizzly bear. Polar bears and, um, and brown bears in general, including the the grizzly bear is only separated by about 100,000 to 300,000 years ago, depending on who you ask. And what's very interesting about them is that they fall in very, very separate geographic locations. Of course, as climate changes, those locations are increasingly overlapping. The feeding zones for some of these animals are overlapping quite tremendously. And people are starting to observe more and more pizzly bears in nature. And very recently, they didn't just observe a first-generation pizzly bear, so just the, hybrid, the immediate hybrid of the parents, 
but they've even observed secondary generations of pizzly bears, meaning that those hybrids are very likely, at least partially fertile, and able to have offspring. What's very interesting is that some people who look at the genetics of paleontology of polar bears, so looking at polar bears in the deep past, have seen that there's this similar kind of hybridization events in other periods that are usually associated with climate change. So it's not just a case of the polar bear, grizzly bear suddenly forming these, these kinds of relationships, but very likely has occurred deeper in the past as well. Other animals which are very exciting to talk about when it comes to hybridization are dogs, coyotes, and wolves. These animals are very prevalent in North America. Wolves generally further north, coyotes more centrally and to the south. And of course, dogs usually more with humans. And every single one of these animals on the slide is a hybrid of these three. Not all three. We have a dog coyote puppy in the corner here, which I think is adorable. We have um, this, uh, two examples of dog wolf hybrids. And if you look at this bottom one here, you can see that black coat is probably inherited from the dog itself and is not inherent from the wolf. We also have another one which also looks a little bit more husky-esque. I uh, won't get into too much detail, but that is quite typical of dog wolf hybrids. And this gorgeous one in the corner here is a koi wolf, which has that beautiful coyote coloring, but the shagginess of a wolf. What's very interesting about these hybrids is that they're acquiring traits that can be selected for, positive traits that might allow them to be more successful, evolutionarily speaking, going forward. For example, in the case of wolves, Hybridizing with dogs gives them gentler personalities and makes them less skittish. So they're less likely to run away from humans and less likely to be killed or chased away by humans because they have a little bit more of a gentler nature. This means that in some ways, hybridizing with dogs is actually beneficial to wolves. Also, in the case of coyotes, they have similar traits when they do hybridize with wolves. They inherit those more uh, subdued traits when interacting with humans, but when they interact with a wolf, as in the beautiful koi wolf in the corner here, they acquire some of the stronger musculature of the wolf, which allows them to hunt larger prey. So now what you're looking at is not a situation of just hybrids existing and that's it, you know. These hybrids are actually acquiring traits that help them, evolutionarily speaking. This doesn't always occur. There are many hybrids that inherit traits that actually make the hybrid less successful in nature, but these are good examples of ones that are actually more successful because of the hybridization process. I could go through many examples, and they will all be anecdotal, but some of the ones I put up here are, um, are quite important, at least for thinking about the discussion. What you see here very much so is marmosets, howler monkeys, baboons, all of which have hybrids within the taxa. So different marmoset uh, species and subspecies hybridize. Same with howler monkeys, different howler monkey species and subspecies hybridize. And the same with baboons. And we'll talk a little bit more about baboons later on in the lecture. What's also very interesting is many different cat species hybridize with um, wilder cat genes, sometimes getting into those domestic cats and creating cats that are not as governable as uh, those before them. Darwin's finches, although it's the only non-mammal in this uh, slideshow, also hybridize. Not all of them do, but some of the subspecies do hybridize, leading to very interesting developments in bird song and beak shape. In the case of wolves, uh, wolves, dolphins and whales, wolves and whales would have been much more interesting, <laughs> but in the case of dolphins and whales, there's also examples of hybrids. And of course, there's um, the zonkey, which I actually just put in because that's a ridiculous name, but it does, zonkeys do hybridize with many quinine species. Of course, now you're naturally thinking, where did I get a picture of such a good looking man? And, uh, and this is a Neanderthal, a human cousin, or a reconstruction of a Neanderthal, who was a human cousin that existed in Europe 
and West Asia until around about 35,000 years ago. The Neanderthal was then disappeared, replaced, it seemed, by Homo sapiens like you and me. Some say we killed them off. Some say we outwitted, outlasted, outplayed them because it's a game of survivor. And um, some say we outhunted them. Some say we had a lot of social intelligence, which the Neanderthals did not have. A lot of these kinds of reasons have been brought into questioning of recent, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. But one thing we do know is that a lot of the research on Neanderthals are redeeming the Neanderthals a little bit. They don't seem to be quite as dim and as antisocial as we once thought they were. In fact, it seems that in many ways they were very much like us. But let me talk a little bit about how a Neanderthal came to be. About 1.5 to 2 million years ago, Homo erectus left Africa, and of course Homo erectus also stayed in Africa, but expanded its territory into Europe and Asia. Once it had done this, of course, a lot of these hominins in these new territories continued evolving. In East Asia, they evolved into a hominin that hasn't very excitedly been called East Asian Homo erectus, but in Europe, it evolved ultimately into the Neanderthal. And there's also a brand new hominin that's known mostly from its DNA, the Denisovan, which seemed to exist in Central, Central Asia, although we don't really know just yet because we actually don't have many fossils from it. From what we know, currently know, we have some fingers, some teeth, and a lot of DNA, which is not very common for us to have in the archaeological record. The question then becomes, what happened to these species? Were those that were outside of Africa replaced by us as humans left Africa over a million years later? Or was there continual evolution and interaction between all of these hominins or human-like cousins leading in a group effort, if you will, to Homo sapiens as we currently exist? This was dichotomized in the multi-regionalism versus out of Africa debate. The two on, the, on this side, multi-regionalism and out of Africa in the center. Under the multi-regional hypothesis, it was Homo erectus and the evolution of the hominins in different areas over the last 1.5 million years that led to all of us, to humans. The multi-regionalism hypothesis has also been used to suggest why humans look quite different from each other. Of course, if you look at many humans, and of course in the past, that was very much prevailed upon. There's different skin tones, different eye shapes, different um, body types, and some people explained that by the multi-region evolution. We skip a few years into the 80s, so just after Jean M. L's work, a lot of really good molecular data started coming out. And by molecular data, I mean protein analysis, I mean DNA, and I mean a lot of different kinds of very fine-scaled work that can look at the different molecules that make up your body, essentially. And what it showed was, even though humans are very, very phenotypically different, even though we look very different externally, maybe that is all it is. In fact, if we look at the DNA, it seems that humans are so closely related that an individual from the Americas and an individual from sub-Saharan Africa will actually be more genetically similar to each other than two individuals in a chimpanzee clan, which is incredible amount of homogeneity in our species. This led scientists to think a lot more about the out of Africa hypothesis where humans evolved more recently in Africa and some of them left Africa only around 200 to 100,000 years ago, replacing all those Homo erectus descendants in Europe and Asia. Another hypothesis which I think was 
put a little bit under the table because it might be a little bit too intermediate for some people, was the assimilation hypothesis, which is here on the left. Under the assimilation hypothesis, it is a mainly out of Africa scenario, but instead of humans displacing those other hominins completely, they interbred with them a little bit. So humans didn't just leave Africa, they left Africa, but, all, but also interbred with some of the hominins that they encountered in Europe and Asia. If we fast forward to 2010, we have the first high coverage genome sequencing of the Neanderthal. And for the first time, we could actually compare the Neanderthal genome directly to ours. What is fantastic about it is that it told us so much about the Neanderthals, but it also told us a little bit about ourselves. It seems that definitely we interbred with Neanderthals, with people of non-Sub-Saharan African descent having anywhere between 1% and 4% Neanderthal ancestry. Contrary to popular belief, and it might not seem terribly intuitive right now, East Asians actually are more likely to have higher proportions of Neanderthal ancestry than Europeans. It also seems as more and more DNA has come out of the ground, as we've been able to extract more DNA and be able to study it from a lot of, not fossils, but all the bones of humans and our cousins, it seems very much, and it's not just the case of us, interbreeding with Neanderthals, but us interbreeding with Denisovans, that species that I told you about, which we only have DNA from and a few teeth. It also seems very likely, sorry, do you want me to? <laughs> it also seems very likely that Neanderthals and Denisovans were interbreeding as well at some point in their evolutionary history. Furthermore, some people have done research a little bit more intensively on modern humans, and it seems that some people also interbred with archaic African hominins that were not necessarily considered homo sapiens on the African continent as well. So there was a big party, and there was a lot of kissing cousins back in the day. And that is essentially why we can consider ourselves as all very similar in many ways and very genetically very close as modern humans, but that we've all acquired DNA from other hominin species that have existed alongside us. So it's not a case of the Neanderthal being ridden away or replaced or violently killed by humans. It seems a little bit more complicated than that. It seems as if there might have been a little bit of relationships as humans have left Africa, as well as within the African continent, of hominins that we actually don't have fossil evidence for, or as far as we know. At least we can't combine the fossil evidence with the genetic evidence just yet. Of course, that's not why you're here. You're here because you want to know what a human Neanderthal hybrid looks like. So I'm going to get to the point now. In the movie, I could only unfortunately find this terrible screenshot um, in the movie, but they had in the book a very nice description of Dirk, who was the human Neanderthal hybrid that was described in Jean Emel's novel, Clan of, Clan of the Cave Bear. In the novel, he had a low forehead, like a high forehead, like a homo sapien, but a little occipital bun or a projection at the back of his head, like a Neanderthal. In the novel, he seemed to have a little bit more of a robust middle face, a face that little projects out a little bit, a little bit more like a Neanderthal. And he had a chin, like a human does. Neanderthals don't tend to have very well-developed chins. That is, that is our thing. And so in the book, what she described was a mixed morphology, a morphology which has a little bit of Neanderthal in it and a little bit of human in it. And for many years, that is actually what we considered as potential when we looked at the hybrid records for a hominin fossil record for hybrids. These are a few examples of potential hybrids that had been described before the Neanderthal sequencing of the genome in 2010. And, um, some of them, such as the school skull of Yar, occurs in the Middle East, which, as you can imagine, is an ideal location for any hominin leaving Africa to meet other hominins. We also have some from Europe, including one, the Lepido child, who existed in Europe much 
much longer after the Neanderthals were wiped out as far as we have um, any other evidence for, around 26,000 years ago. But in order to really understand what a hybrid looks like, it's one thing to use common sense, but it is important to also use science. And the thing about science is that it can sometimes surprise you when you give it a shot. For my research and the research of others, I won't lay claim as being the only person who's bothered to look at this kind of information before, I was looking at mouse hybridization. There are many different species and subspecies of mice, many of which hybridize in nature. In China, two different species of mice hybridized so successfully that the hybrid itself has formed a hybrid species, one of the first characterized. In Europe, the hybrids are very different. They are so unsuccessful that it's created a very narrow hybrid zone which prevents the parents from crossing from one region to the other very well. Because when they're hybridized, the hybrids are very sickly with very low fertility. When I looked at some of these mice and their hybrids, one of the things that popped out to us was that the hybrids tend to have very large heads, as well as some of the shape in the heads seem to be associated more with the largeness of the head than inherited directly from either of the parent species. Just to simplify that, if you have a skull that is very big, in order to accommodate the size of the skull, the shape needs to change as well. When you take that out, because if you use very fancy statistical techniques, you can at least take out a large proportion of the size and how it relates to shape. The shape actually tends to resemble the smaller of the two parents, possibly because of the size that was inherent when we took it out of the analysis initially. What's very interesting is that that is actually seen in um, other, other animals that have been studied for hybrids. Not always as many species in these other animals to work with, not always as big databases or as, um, or as um, thoroughly genetically uh, consolidated as in the mice, but what's very interesting is we, they seem to show the same kinds of patterns. In baboon species, when they're hybridized, and I've shown you this graph, you probably can't see it, but there are many different baboon species and subspecies. We've got some, of course, in Southern Africa, but there's also some in Central and, uh, and East Africa, a little one over there in, um, in West Africa, as well as nearer to the Middle East. There's a lot of different species and subspecies, and I can tell you there are also a lot of different hybrid zones for those species and subspecies to mix and interact. When we look at their skulls, they tend to have also an intermediate features in general, but what's very unusual is that there will be traits that are larger than the parents from which they come. So they're not all intermediate. So just to sum up that kind of research, what would we expect a human Neanderthal hybrid to look like? Maybe like a human in many ways because a human is the smaller of the two parents, but a big human and with some size related shape change. That is the extent of my photoshopping skills, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and we do actually have many examples of that. If I had to go back, remember that, that diagram with the Neanderthal and um, all the potential hybrids that we have here. Some of the ones right on the right actually seem to have some of that general morphology. So it's very likely that they could actually be hybrids, at least based on some of these analyses. Other research, and mine seems to support this, shows that hybrids not only have unusual size-related shape changes or size, shape, or size changes, but they also have really strange morphologies, such as extra teeth that are not found in the parents. If you look at your own mouth, you only have one canine on each of the quadrants of your mouth. So two on the top, two at the bottom, one on each side of the top, one on each side of the bottom. In these individuals, there were two canines. <laughs> there are also examples of very strange sutures. 
sutures are the gaps between the bones that form the face and the head, occurring where you don't necessarily expect it, such as in this wildebeest hybrid. And you also have strange morphologies when it is relevant on the horns of some of the hybrids that, um, that have been studied. So in general, hybrids don't necessarily only look intermediate to their parents or like a combination of the two parents that made them up. Hybrids, particularly those of divergent parents, actually tend to have some unusual traits traits that you wouldn't even expect in either of the parents at all, possibly due to some kind of developmental breakdown that occurs when the genomes or the genetics of those two parents recombine. So what is, do we have an example of a, a very good example of a human Neanderthal hybrid? The best example that has come up recently is that of the Owasi mandible. To give you some background, the Owasi mandible over here, or jawbone, is very much associated with the cranium, but there are two different individuals. So similar layers, similar ages, but, very, uh, but different individuals, so not the same. We have genetic data for the Owasi mandible. Do you know what it is? I hope so. <laughs> it's a very strange talk if you didn't want to know that. It seems that this Oasi mandible has a Neanderthal ancestor going between four and eight generations back. So this Oasi mandible, as an individual, as a human individual, had a great, 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 great grandfather or grandmother that was Neanderthal. Unfortunately, the, de the genetics that we have from the mandible isn't as good as the ones that were acquired with sequencing the Neanderthal genome. So until more is extracted or understood about this, we can't exactly pinpoint whether it was the grandmother or grandfather or any other kind of information just yet. But I think that's something to, um, to think about going forward and to watch the news for. Maybe, maybe if you leave this room, something will come. That's found in Romania. So in Europe, in, um, in the more eastern parts of Europe. Sorry, I'm not catching the way you said it. Because you were right, you were right. This is a particular hybrid with a few generations here back from the animal. What was the name you gave it? Oasi. O-A-S-E. Found in Romania. So we know what at least one human Neanderthal hybrid looks like. Of course, another part of this question is how would they know that it was that far apart? And the reason is, is because the sequences of genes that they have that are Neanderthal in origin are a little bit bigger than what we have, for instance, in ourselves if we have some Neanderthal ancestry. What's more is that if we look at the older literature on the mandible, the teeth tend to be larger than both humans and Neanderthals, which fits in very well with our model, that there are extreme morphologies or extreme size differences between the hybrids and even both of their parents. So if you had to measure a tooth of a hybrid, a Neanderthal, and a Homo sapien, the Homo sapien and the Neanderthal will more likely overlap than the hybrid. This is important for one very specific reason. While we do have genetic evidence for Neanderthals and for humans, and we can very likely find more genetic data as these techniques become more sophisticated, what about in the case when we don't have bone at all, when the genetics hasn't survived, when the bone has fully fossilized and there can be no recovery of DNA? We still need to rely on some of these techniques in order to figure out whether even more ancient hominins, such as Australopithecines, such as Homo habilis and Homo erectus, whether they were interbreeding. Maybe paleontologists themselves can use this even further back in time to see if different species of older apes and primates were interbreeding, based on some of these, um, these, these results that have come out of research like mine and others. <coughs> 
The hominid fossil record is very, very large. And in Africa specifically, almost all the hominins that we have are fully fossilized in very hot, sometimes unusual kinds of environments where it's very unlikely that all this DNA would have preserved very well. So we do need to use morphology, not just rely on ancient DNA, to actually give us a little bit more information about hominins in the past and how they were interacting. Thank you very much. Just in case I don't think any of these animals exist in nature, so <laughs> you can probably check that out for me. Are there any questions? I think um, this is usually a topic that spurs quite a bit of discussion. Yes. So they are descended from the Homo erectus that originally came out of Africa 1.5 to 2 million years ago. But they themselves, from Homo erectus, evolved in Europe and Asia. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So Cro-Magnon actually evolved from the Homo erectus in Africa, left around about 40,000 years ago into Europe, and replaced those Neanderthals in Europe. So but that's actually a very... Exactly. So Cro-Magnon is from, from that other wave, the wave that, uh, that, we, that we all descend from. In fact, um, saint Césaire is a Cro-Magnon. Saint-Cezaire. S-A-I-N-T, and then C-E-Z-A-I-R-E. It's like a little spelling bee. I should have probably put these names on. Yeah. Of the two parents. So they'll be large, like the larger parent, but it seems that when you clear that up, they tend to resemble the smaller parent. I'm hoping that more research into that will clarify whether that's always the case, but so far the pattern holds. Other reasons? Uh, it, it does make a difference to the survivability, the appearance of the hybrid, whether the father or the mother came with from, different, from the two species. Yes. Tigers and lions, depends upon which one is the male and which one is the female. Exactly. Have you got any evidence for Neanderthal human hybrids? Uh, the ones that have survived, the, the genes that have survived, are they come from a female material? That's an excellent question, um, and I didn't go into it in this lecture, but actually I really think that's a nice subject to bring up. We actually have no evidence as to whether it was more successful to come from a male Neanderthal or a female Neanderthal. And the reason for that seems to be, this is a lot of heavy literature, so I'm summarizing it for you quite, hopefully quite nicely. The reason seems to be that sex chromosomes, X's and Y's, and as well as mitochondrial DNA, tend to be very finicky when working in different species. So even if it's not lost in the first generation, it won't be lost in the first generation, you have to in inherit either an X or Y from your, your parents, it will generally be lost in the second or third generation, just because those hybrids, those secondary uh, tertiary generation hybrids, just will inherit um, a lot of uh, very strange developmental anomalies. So um, it very much seems that in almost all hybrids, sex chromosomes are the first to go. And that makes it very difficult to study whether they come from um, Neanderthal males or Neanderthal females or if there's directionality. But that is a very excellent point because, um, because that would be very nice to know, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think you said that the percentage of the Antal DNA in Homo sapiens varies between one and about four percent. Yes. Are the four percenters found in a particular 
It's just dispersed throughout um, Eurasia, essentially, and North Africa. Has anyone looked at the high percenters and tried to determine how they differ in any way you wish from those with low percent? So um, I, think, I think there's two ways to, ask, to answer this question. High percentage of Neanderthal um, ancestry can occur all across the board in many different proportions of in many different populations. So whether you're from a little town in China or a little town in Czechoslovakia, your chances of having one to four percent is probably a little higher in China, but it will also be very disparate in that group, same as in the little town in Czechoslovakia. However, there has been research done on individual genes that have been acquired from Neanderthals, and uh, here's the kicker. They're not always good. <laughs> there seems to be some cases where Neanderthals, um, where we tend to inherit some kinds of uh, genes from Neanderthals which allow for, for instance, skin waterproofing. And um, that is particularly in East Asians. Um, that particular gene, although the general percent can vary as to wh which population might have it. There are genes for, um, for a lot of skin genes, a lot of autoimmune disease genes, a lot of immune, uh, immunity genes in general, very likely because when we interbred with the Neanderthals, we were going into environments where there were new pests, new diseases, and so inheriting those genes were probably very evolutionarily advantageous. But there's also genes that we don't necessarily consider as very good that, are, that have high proportions of disease acquirement, diabetes cystic fibrosis, and many other kinds of things. And um, I think what really needs to be done at this point and this stage is to try and break that down and to see um, who it affects and whether those are just anomalies that occur because we're in a modern population and it hasn't been selected out yet, or hopefully not at all because you don't like to think about that in modern humans, but it hasn't been selected out. or. Um, or if there's maybe some other reason. So a lot of research now needs to go into figuring out what to do with this information. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, <coughs> I found this very, very interesting, but uh, very you. interesting indeed. But we would also like to hear at some, in some future, has the same thing happened in Africa? Do yes. we also have a kind of Neanderthal here amongst them and so on? And is there that sort of admixture? And we seem to be under the impression everybody who is not white and a colonial is automatically homo sapiens finished up. And it's not like that. No, it's, it's not, like no. Um, in fact, um, as I said earlier, North Africans also tend to have um, high proportions of Neanderthal genomes. Uh, there's been uh, some res there's not a lot of research in genetics in sub-Saharan Africa just yet, just because of the warmth and the climate and in some cases maybe um, the politics around getting ancient DNA from certain kinds of uh, hominins. Also a lot of our hominins are fossilized, which means it's very difficult to do that for, although I do know that some people are very much trying to get ancient DNA from them. But it very much seems, based on modern human DNA, that there were other archaics living in Africa during the evolution of our species of Homo sapiens. And as we expanded our territory, some people very likely did interact with some of these archaics in Africa as well. So it's a very complicated, messy story. And what's very likely, if you, if you have to think about the human fossil record around 100,000 years ago, we probably have anywhere between five that we know of and maybe even ten, maybe more, hominin species living at the same time as we're evolving, which is phenomenal. And we know of some, I didn't mention Homo floresiensis, but that's the little hobbit that's found in Indonesia. There's the Denisovans in Central, um, in Central Asia, more needs to be discovered from them. We've got East Asian hominins, we've got Neanderthals, and now because of the DNA, but not because of fossils, we know that there's at least one group in Africa. And that's not even us, <laughs> you know, we've still got Homo sapiens to think about. So um, lots of hominin species, and knowing humans, we've probably had a little good go at interbreeding with at least all of them. So, um, so yeah, it's a very complicated, messy picture, um, but, hope, but it allows for a lot of fun science in the near future. <laughs>
It's very similar in morphology. Now, this, I'm putting myself out there because I can tell you there's going to be a whole bunch of paleoanthropologists who can probably debate this for years. But it seems to come from that initial out of Africa event from the Homo erectus. And some have argued that the reason it is so small and with a small brain is because of a process called insular dwarfism, where if you're on an island, animals tend to be smaller because there's fewer resources. And a brain is specifically is very hungry organ, so that will tend, might get smaller as well, but of course um, much more research needs to be found. We do have um, a little granddaddy from Homo, for Homo floresiensis that's about 800,000 years, I think, maybe, maybe a little more recent, also in Indonesia. So it's actually very likely to have been that case, that it came from one of those earlier dispersals. Yeah. But also very interesting hominin. Yes? Yeah? Where are the aborigines in this? The aborigines? Aboriginals come from a, one of those out of Africa dispersals around 50 to 60,000 years ago. So possibly one of the original Homo sapien expansions out of Africa. So, um, so it's, we, we talk about, I've spoken about two major waves. It's very likely to have been many. And a lot of Homo sapiens, um, the first expansion for Homo sapiens, not Homo erectus, happened around 100,000 years ago. And it seems as if aboriginals did the expansion around 60,000 years ago, colonizing the southern coast of Asia and um, ultimately expanding into um, Australia. Very fascinating is that we have no evidence for how they got to Australia, because Australia's always been an island, so it's very likely that they got there by boat, which means that there must have been some kind of rafting boat technology around 60,000 years ago. So yes, they could have probably walked right through to Indonesia, but they would have needed a boat to Papua New Guinea and to, um, to Australia. But you bring up a nice point that, of course, the map that we're looking at now is not necessarily the map from 100,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago. There would have been a lot more land when, um, when the ice caps were a little bit uh, larger. I haven't, and it's such a pity. Hominin I mean, is very difficult to fit into a hybrid hominin talk. Um, although I promise you, I should actually try harder in the future to do so. Hominin I mean, is a very interesting find. Um, absolutely fascinating that it's, that there's two cave systems, both of which have this assemblage of hominins in them, and no other animals. Homo naledi, for those of you who don't know, is a small-bodied, small-brained uh, creature dated currently to about 300,000 years ago, meaning that it's, one, it's a small-brained hominin living when all the other hominins except for Homo floresiensis in Indonesia has big brains. So why they existed, persisted so late, and why they seem to be associated with Middle Stone Age technology, which we consider as fairly advanced, and how they got into these deep, dark cave systems is quite a mystery. So I think uh, if, you, if you do manage to read up a little bit more about it, please do. It's very exciting research. Not too much to say about hybrids and, and Naledi, but, um, but I'll definitely try my luck. <laughs> Sorry? DNA? Not yet. I think they've tried, but um, currently they haven't been successful. From what I understand, the, it hasn't completely fossilized yet, which means there is potential, but the technology has to be a little bit better. Yeah. That would be very exciting. Ha, ha, ha.
so th there's a lot of complexity when we talk about genes and how they arise in humans. It's very, not everybody who has a diabetes genes gets to get diabetes, and not everyone who doesn't have some of these diabetes genes doesn't get diabetes. What we're talking about here are proportions and chances more than anything else. So, um, so yes, I think, uh, I think you've got a good point. Sometimes, uh, sometimes people do have a little bit of bad luck when it comes to the run of the draw, and maybe people should be a little bit more sympathetic about that. Um, but, uh, but, but we are talking about a little bit more of a messy picture than a one-to-one -one genetic relationship. Um. <laughs> That is such a fantastic question. I think that's one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves living in such a diverse country. One of the biggest reasons is, um, is that we, are, we have what's called very plastic phenotype, which means you put somebody in a different kind of environment and they actually change according to that environment quite nicely. Um, a very a silly, but I think a poignant example is that people will be a little browner if they get raised in a warmer or a more direct sunlight region. Of course, you have to have some tanning genes, and you might not necessarily be as brown as the local inhabitants of that region, but that is one way in which we're plastic. The second reason, and I think I'm going to give skin color evolution as a very nice example of this, is that Genes that code for things like skin and hair are so important because that is your direct barrier to the environment. So in environments where there's very low sunlight, where the sunlight is at an angle to the shape of the earth and has to pass through a lot of atmosphere, such as in very northern Europe or very southern uh, parts of, say, South America, you need to have vitamin D, right? Vitamin D is made in the skin by sunlight or by an interaction with molecules in the sun with sunlight. So having very dark skin that absorbs the, um, the, the, the radiation before it gets to those molecules is very bad. And that's how we get things like very light skin color. And in the equatorial regions where the sunlight is much more direct, that sunlight breaks down other kinds of molecules like folic acid. Folic acid is very important for making DNA. In other words, making babies. And therefore, that will also reduce your fertility if you, um, if you um, are very light-skinned constantly in a very heavy, UV-heavy uh, environment. So, um, so skin color is a particularly interesting one because that that evolution is so um, specific because it can really determine your infertility levels at a very high level. Of course, today we don't have to worry about that. Um, a lot of us are lighter skinned people in a country that has a little bit more sunlight than maybe our, our more recent ancestors were exposed to. But that's okay, because we're doing this lecture indoors, we wear clothes, we wear sunblock. And of course, in northern countries, where sometimes dark-skinned people live, they tend to have fortified milks and fortified juices. So they get their vitamin D that way. So that is one example, but similar examples can be made for things like hair texture, etc. cetera. Um, so it's just a, a matter of the things that we choose to look at just tend to be very high, uh, very much more likely to be on our skin. That's just into, in the news, it was that the, the Homo sapiens from southern Africa was light-skinned, and he went darker and darker as he went through the equator. It was in the news. <laughs> everywhere. So um, I, th I, think <laughs> I think there's a little bit of misleading there. Um, one of the things is that it's very likely that if we go back further to past two million years ago, Homo erectus lost their fur, and the fur became very reduced. As a result, instead of having a chimpanzee-like fur pattern, we have what we have now, or a little bit more like we have now. The reasons for that are very interesting and complicated, uh, but it mainly has to do with sweating. Sweating when you have a lot of fur is very difficult. And as we lost some of that fur, our 
skin was recently exposed. If you look at chimpanzees or gorillas, they tend to have very lovely dark faces. And if you brush away this, their fur, it's very lightly pigmented underneath it. And of course, once we lost our fur, we inherited, we essentially evolved darker and darker skin, especially in the, in the central regions. By the time we get to Homo sapiens, the first Homo sapiens would have, in Africa, would have very likely have been dark-skinned and would have lost that as they moved further north. Just, I mean, the one reason for phenotypic variation is the wide dispersal. Mm. So but another one could be because we're intensely social species and we're already developing uh, tribal cognitive, you know, tribal psychologies, that phenotypic uh, differences were a, a means of creating barriers between leading groups of people. Yes. So it was selected for by, by populations. Things that distinguish one population from another population may have been simply selected for So sexual selection is definitely um, something that has a very interesting uh, research history. And um, definitely, it's very interesting to look at in, uh, in other animals, but it's very difficult to look at in humans. What you're mentioning is um, barriers that are being caused by the sexual selection. And actually, when we look at the, you, at the archaeological record and the paleoanthropological record, and even at modern humans, Barriers actually don't exist. We have what's called clinal variation. So if we looked at Southern Africa, Central Africa, Northern Africa, Middle East, Europe, you see a slow change, for instance, in skin color, a slow change in, in characteristics. There's certainly not a, a distinct barrier that can easily be placed separating geographic, uh, geographic populations. Considering your long and detailed answer to the gentleman in the back about appearance <laughs> um, that immediately suggested to me an explanation why superficially two groups of homo sapiens in Australia and in uh, Africa are superficially similar. I'm exactly. The and the reason could be, following on what you said, that each of those groups crossed the um, equatorial regions, one going north and the other coming south, and obviously you don't walk across it uh, as in a plane in a few hours, you take <laughs> tens of thousands of years. Exactly. And so the explanation you gave would immediately <coughs> explain why two people at the end of this long uh, distance were superficially similar and exactly. the people didn't work. But if that is true, why are the people who live That is actually also another interesting question. One of the, the reasons, I don't have a picture of, uh, of the Americas with me, which is actually my oversight, I really should have. The Americas are very recently populated, and that is one of the biggest reasons. And, we're not, and while I talk about very fast evolution, we're talking about 40,000 years versus 14,000 years. And even if you look in, South, in the Americas, if you had to take like a sort of a skin color chart from very north to very south, you have a situation of lighter, 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 a little darker, a little darker, a little darker, dark, certainly not like in Africa and Australia, and then it gets lighter again. So it's still that, de that gradation is there, but yes, it's far less uh, extreme as we see, for instance, across Africa into Europe. <laughs> sure, no problem. Not much at all. Ten thousand. Yeah. Um, you actually bring. Uh, it's it's very nice to have um, a, a, a more widely read <laughs> student body. It's actually lovely. Um, 
you're bringing up a very nice point that was actually um, explained by Ambrose and other um, and other and other um, very good researchers back in the 90s, which was used to explain why humans are so genetically similar is possibly because we went through a bottlenecking, which means a huge proportion of the population died and we were only left with a small number of humans. The uh, date given was meant to be around about 70,000 years ago, which was during a very big volcanic eruption that had occurred. And that volcanic eruption is actually also the reason that cheetahs are very homogeneous in terms of their genetics. Unfortunately, it's a little bit more extreme in cheetahs. But in humans, that has been one of the proposals that have brought up. It's also a time period which is very scant in terms of um, human fossils and human uh, archaeological finds, so that helped support it. But um, there's not too much evidence. There's a little bit of evidence, but there's not too much. And I think now that the ancient DNA is uh, becoming a little bit more sophisticated, that exact bottlenecking is very likely going to be more fleshed out to see whether it did occur or whether it was that extreme. Some estimates have said that we probably went to about 10,000 humans, which is not a lot at all, in order to have a very geographically expansive group of modern humans that we have now, starting out with 10,000 is quite a, quite a minuscule amount, really, in the grand scheme of things. Sure, I'm not sure where, uh, what the time is. Seven. So we went off, a, oh, it's, it's half past six now. I think we can have last questions, final question. Okay. You too, yeah. That is actually also was something that was deeply looked into the second the DNA genome sequencing occurred because um, there was older evidence from more scant DNA that seemed to suggest that maybe, Nian, maybe we acquired red hair uh, for those who have it from Neanderthals. But it seems now that, um, that the red hair might have evolved separately in humans and Neanderthals. Unfortunately, red hair is um, not so much uh, a gene uh, more than an absence of a gene, so it's a little easier to inherit um, that way, unfortunately. But, but you never know. There might be one or two. <laughs> How did they ever get the <laughs> That's another question. <laughs> The days before Facebook. <laughs> so uh, she asked if there were only 10,000 uh, Homo sapiens, how on earth did they end up meeting up with Neanderthals um, given the expanse of the world? Um, there's two things. The first is we don't know if there were 10,000 uh, 10,000 humans, I think that there, a little bit more research needs to go into that to confirm. So it's very likely that that might not be the case. Uh, the second thing is a lot can happen in 20,000 years. <laughs> so, um, so maybe, maybe uh, the, the group would have had to expand quite tremendously to not just interbreed with the Neanderthals, but overwhelm them indeed. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Good thought. It, um, so. Sure, I think that's done. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I'll <laughs> see you